One of the common elements in science fiction movies is a floating display. A screen appears in mid-air, out of nowhere, and can be controlled in a magical way. Fingers don't touch anything, they just tap the air. But you might be surprised to hear that this isn't just science fiction. This type of display has been around for a while and is used for things like touchless elevator controls or point-of-sales terminals. Surprisingly, the underlying principle is not too difficult, so I decided to build my own version and in this video I will show you the principle and build process. A floating display, also known as an aerial display, is a device that shows information in mid-air, no hardware involved. For example, in one of my previous projects, the volumetric display, I used a semi-transparent screen for the projection of image slices. This device doesn't have anything to project on. It uses some optical components to converge light to an outside focus plane to form a real image in mid-air. And just to be clear, this is different from a simple Pepper's Ghost display, where object reflections can be seen behind a display glass. The device consists of a bright display, a beam splitter and a special element called retro reflector. So what is a retro reflector? Let's look at the standard mirror to understand this. If you shine light on a mirror with an angle of incidence, it will be reflected at the same angle to the surface normal as the incident ray. This material, however, will reflect the light back to the source, no matter which way it came from. This is achieved through glass beads or microprisms embedded in the sheeting. Retro reflectors are used on traffic signs, bicycles and safety equipment to make them more visible. Now let's go back to our device and take a look at how the optical components work together. First, the light emitted by the display is partly reflected by the beam splitter. Then it hits the reflector, and as explained earlier, the rays do not converge further out, but are sent back in the same direction they came from. This is the essential detail to understand how this works. The light returning from the reflector is sent back to the beam splitter, then travels across the beam splitter, and finally the rays converge at a point outside the device to form an aerial image. There are several ways to arrange the three optical components, but the basic version is shown here. This simple cardboard experiment demonstrates the principle and is a good starting point if you want to try this yourself. All you need is a tablet computer, a piece of plexiglass as a semi-transparent mirror, and the retro-reflective foil. That's the only tricky part to get. I tried several products available online, some worked, some produced a very blurry image, some did not work at all. You need a bit of luck to find the right material. To learn where I got this stuff from and other details, see the project page, link is in the description. It's probably worth mentioning that LED matrix displays are also perfect for this. For example, this 64 by 32 pixel LED matrix panel from Adafruit works great. The large pixel pitch and high brightness help to overcome some of the limitations of the reflector material. Ultimately, I chose an outdoor rated monitor that I got on eBay. It was supposed to be over 1000 nits bright. I have to admit, even the display seems brighter than some have seen, but it's not overly bright. But in the end, it worked fine for my setup, so I decided to keep it. 
Once my cardboard prototype was up and running, I decided to go for a more stable design of the case and to put it all together using aluminium profiles. Also, for my final version, I changed the configuration slightly because I wanted the floating image to appear above the machine, not in front. And instead of the plexiglass, I used a teleprompter glass that you can buy online. I wanted to be able to interact with my floating display, so I had to find a way to detect the position of a finger in the air. For this DIY version, all I need is a simple interaction, so just a couple of defined areas where I can tap on a button or something like that. Therefore, I started to test some sensors for this purpose. The first sensor I found was the ZX Gesture Sensor from SparkFun. It uses an infrared light emitter and two receivers and claims to be able to detect movements and position of an object above the sensor. Setup and connection was straightforward. All we need is 5V and a connection to the I2C bus. And as you can see here, the gesture recognition works quite well with the examples provided. It can detect left, right and up swipes almost without a problem. However, the output of the position was already not very precise especially when I used only a finger instead of my hand. The calculation of the position is based on the amount of reflection, which is more an approximation than an accurate measurement. So I was wondering if this sensor would be a good choice for my purpose. As you may have noticed, I've been doing these tests in very low light conditions. There was a good reason for that, because watch what happens when I turn on the room light. The sensor immediately spits out garbage data. This is because many light sources do not only emit light in the visible spectrum, but they also contain a certain amount of infrared light as well. Which means I cannot rely on the measurements in bright light conditions. Unfortunately, this rules out the sensor for my purpose. So I started looking for sensors that were not so sensitive to ambient light and turned to time-of-flight sensors. Time-of-flight sensors are now common for robotics, drones and other applications and have become truly affordable. I started testing the well-known VL53 LOX from ST Microelectronics. It has a single laser transmitter and receiver in the same package, so it's very compact. Setting up and connecting was as easy as the previous sensor. All we need is 5V and an I2C bus connection. The sensor emits small pulses of invisible laser light, which can be slightly seen by the camera sensor of my phone. Time of flight sensors measure the time it takes for a laser pulse to emit, reflect off an object and return to its sensor. This allows for accurate distance measurement and it also works under normal conditions of ambient light. As you can see here, it can provide accurate distance values in millimeters and in the range where the floating display would be. So this sensor could work really well for this use case. However, this is only a one-dimensional measurement. But to determine the position on our floating display, we need to expand to a 2D plane, for which we obviously need multiple sensors. At first, I tried to use two sensors from both sides and place them at an angle. My idea was that they could detect an object from the side and I would use triangulation to find the exact position. This somehow worked, but since the field of view is quite small, the overlapping field is too small for this setup. So I changed the sensor position to the front and mounted several sensors side by side. For my system, I would end up needing three sensors to have a sufficient system field of view. I used an Arduino Nano to collect the sensor data and programmed it to send all distance measurements via serial port. After some testing on a breadboard, I built a prototype board to have a more compact form factor. With my little sensor array, I used three sections within the display field and in each section, I should get a vertical position. I decided a total of nine touch fields must be reliably detected, which should be sufficient for our purposes. Here's a first test of my sensor subsystem, sending data via serial communication to a terminal on my PC. Of course, I have no idea if this data is meaningful, so I wrote a program on the PC for graphical display. It receives the sensor data via a COM port and shows the distance information as a colored dot. Looks quite promising. Now let's put the sensor array in its intended position. 
To see if this works, I had to find the sensor values that correspond to the real positions on my floating display. So I modified the test program to display a simple grid and highlight a field when one of the sensor positions is in a defined range. It took some fine tuning, but in the end, I managed to find the values for all nine touch areas. Now we have a floating touch display. Okay, a simple one. To complete the device, I use a Latipanda single board computer as the central brain of this machine. It provides an easy method for displaying standard images and animations on my floating display. The field monitor is connected via HDMI port as a second display, while the integrated front screen is used for direct control of the single board computer. For me, the touch screen was a great addition to the machine giving it this special design element that makes it look like a communications module from the future. Another great thing about the Latte Panda, you can hook it up directly to the Arduino Nano sensor module. Using one of the three provided USB interfaces, the single board computer provides power to the Nano and at the same time, it reads the data via an emulated UART. All right, we've got the basic framework in place. So apart from being a science fiction gadget, what could it be used for? First, the narrow field of view is ideal for secure data entry because the image is only visible from a direct line of sight. This makes it perfect for entering data safely in crowded places. Another great use case would be a voting machine. And since the pandemic, there's been a lot of interest in touchless operating concepts, which are great for keeping things really sterile. So it could be perfect for self-service machines, where orders are typically placed via touchscreens. What are your ideas for potential use cases? Let me know in the comments section below. Basically that's it for this video. The last part is just a montage of the case design without any comments for those who are interested. Thanks for watching.